Okay, Larry, I think you can do an introduction. Well, welcome, David. Um, we're, we're very happy. Uh, this is Democrats Abroad at Lake Chapala Chapter. I'm the vice chair. Uh, our chair is en route, but uh, David, I've watched you on MSNBC. I'm reading both of your books and I really appreciate you coming today. So um, I guess without taking any further time, I'm, I'm extremely happy that you're here and, and please begin. Thank you very much. I'm honored to, to be with you. It sounds like most of you are, are from the Democrats Abroad Mexico chapter. And I see online that Lake Chapalo is the single largest concentration of expats in the world. I never knew that. Um, uh, I'm actually uh, with you also. It's fitting. I'm with you from abroad as well. I'm actually up in a cottage in Canada, which is why my room looks a little dark and cabin-like. I'm in Georgian Bay. So I'm it's very fitting that I'm on Democrats Abroad tonight. So I'm going to, uh, I, I think I'm going to talk for about half an hour and then go to Q&A. Uh, some of you may have heard uh, some of this. I hope it's not too repetitive. And if you've read my books, um, you're going to hear a lot of what you've read uh, from the person who wrote the words. But hopefully that's what you hope for. And then we can talk, uh, answer any questions and how it, um, by the way, I see that Randy is in Canada as well. Uh, good to see you but most of you I think are in Mexico. And, and uh, people ask me all the time, well, how does what I'm saying apply to folks who are abroad? We can talk about that after I present, but basically almost everything I'm saying, um, if, if you think about it in the way I'm hoping people start to organize with a little more of a sense of their own footprint applies to people who are abroad doing the work that Democrats Abroad is doing. Um, it obviously may take more creativity, um, and more of a long reach than folks in the states, but, um, and you know this, uh, you're on the front lines of democracy as much as anybody, uh, both where you are, but also the states you are from. And there's ways, the roles I ask people to play all across the country, obviously you guys can play as well, and you, you know better than I, uh, your margins can make the difference in so many states between losing and victory, and uh, statewide, as well as in all the other races state house, school board, everything else uh, that, um, that um, but you remind me of what you're allowed to vote in, but um, that plays such a big role in democracy. So let me start out by just sharing a screen that walks through the basics. I'm going to do this quickly so we have time for questions. Uh, and again, I apologize if some have seen this. Um, so cutting way, way to the chase here. Um, and this will, as Larry said, this will cover a whole lot of laboratories of autocracy and a whole lot of saving democracy in just a few slides. Um, I worry that as we watch the discussion and the debate about American politics, uh, we have simplified it in recent years, recent decades in a way that has greatly blinded us to what's really happening and actually made it far more difficult for those who care about democracy to actually um, protect democracy. Uh, and I'm a, and my, my books are trying to be a wake-up call to what the actual battles look like, because until we see that, as sobering as it may be to see it, we'll be far better equipped to deal with what's happening than if we simply view it too simplistically. When I say simplistically, what I'll, I'll describe real quick, and again, Larry, you'll have gotten to this in, in, in the second book uh, quite early. We, we have watched the politics for too long and treated it as if it's a single battle between red and blue. The American political battle, there's a red side and a blue side. We duke it out in a few swing states and at each election, one side wins and one side loses. And then we start over and do it two, more, two years later. Um, and I worry that that is a simplistic narrative that, that is blinding us to what's really happening long term. Uh, so I actually think the two sides are fighting such different battles the goals are different. The tactics and strategies are so different that we're better off seeing the battles as two different battles. Uh, and when we do that, we actually see the other side's battle for what it is, which is going to make us see why our battle is not what it needs to be if we're going to succeed. What are the two battles? Real quick, I'll cut right to the chase on this too. The side on the left's battle, and that's not just Democrats, it's independents, it's even some moderate Republicans, it's the mainstream media for the most part. This side has two assumptions it brings to the, its thought about the battle of American politics. One assumption for a long time, changing recently, has been, you know, democracy is pretty much intact. It's stable. It's here to stay. It's sort of as American as baseball and 
apple pie and mom, to use that old expression. And, and so democracy, we haven't really worried about its health for much of the last, let's say, 40 years. Uh, we've taken it for granted. We were wrong to do so. We can come about that later. But that's been one of the fundamental assumptions that democracy is pretty much intact and almost, and in the end, I'm afraid, take it for granted because of that mindset. But that's been an underlying assumption of one side. It's changing lately, but for a long time. And an alarm now that that's changing, which shows you that we did take it for granted. Number two, this side has another assumption that it actually is quite accurate. This side's assumption is it's most of the views it's asserting in the political battle, in its political battle, um, most of those views are mainstream majoritarian even, um, that, that these views are ones that if, if you assert them the right way in an election, um, you're going to win. And, and this side is right, actually, in thinking this, whether it's a woman's right to choose, common sense gun reform, dealing with climate change, a middle class based economics, the kind that Joe Biden talked about in the State of the Union versus trickle down, being against book banning, on and on and on, you know, broader access to health care, uh, higher wages, higher minimum wage public schools, collective bargaining. These are not controversial positions. In fact, they're mainstream. Most of them are supported by a broad majority of Americans, even in red states. We saw that with Kansas on abortion. We would see that in another, you know, in Ohio right now, we have a big battle. 60% of Ohioans, for the most part, support a broader right to choose. So this side understands that democracy, uh, believes democracy is intact and stable, and is confident that its viewpoints will win the day because they're majoritarian viewpoints. So this side's political battle is quite a simple one. It's go out and win elections. It's over election outcomes. And this side, as we've all done for years, because it's efficient, and because for the most part, the biggest movements forward on the issues that this side cares about have always come through federal legislation. This side greatly prioritizes federal races to the exclusion of most other races when it comes to the attention and dollars, right? And that means this side very quickly focuses on a few swing states that give it the federal majorities it needs to, to accomplish those goals and gets especially excited in, in, in even years, especially the presidential year. So we've been through this many times, haven't we? Every election cycle is about the federal races. It's quickly about a few swing states to determine the outcome. And when we win those swing states, like we did in 08 to elect Obama and Democrats at federal level, or 2020 when Biden won to beat Trump, or other years, we celebrate like we've won the entire battle, don't we? We, we literally, we can remember the moments. And those were big wins. But here's the problem. Celebrating those wins as if we've won the entire battle is assuming that's the other side's battle too. And here's the bad news that we kind of relearn every couple cycles about four or five months after we win our battle and we celebrate like we won every battle, we all of a sudden kind of sense, you know what? Democracy still seems to be losing. Democracy still seems to be sinking even after 2020 when we thought beating Trump meant we won our huge battle, didn't we? Well, why is that? Because the other side's battle is not the battle I just described that ours is. The other side's battle is quite different. And their, their battle is so different that even at moments where we think we've won as if they're done, they're still moving forward in their battle. Now, what's their battle that's so different? First, the exact assumptions that I described us having, theirs are the opposite. First, they understand that democracy is not magically intact and stable like we've sort of thought for a long time, sort of a post 60s voting rights act a, a privileged view of it. They've known that's not true. They've known that certain uh, institutions can be used in negative ways to undermine democracy. That, that, and I'll go through what those institutions are in a second. Um, but uh, they know that. They study it. They didn't go to Orban to, to, to sell it. They didn't go to Hungary to celebrate you know, tourism there. They went to study Orban because he's used certain institutions to undermine democracy. They know that. They want to learn that. That's why they invited him back to Texas. And that's why they went back to Hungary the next year. So their goal, they understand that democracy can be undermined and under sustained attack can really be subverted. They understand that. But number two, and this is even more important in the long run, maybe, 
They also understand, by the way, democracy undermines a part of our history going back centuries. It's happened again and again. Jim Crow being maybe the most uh, you know, egregious example after a healthy, diverse democracy started to build in the South following the Civil War. So we have a very clear history that democracy can be undermined. It happens here, it happens in other countries. Number two assumption, though, is that unlike the side on the left side of this um, little, little diagram, they understand that their views are largely unpopular to the point of being toxic in many cases. Abortion bans, no exceptions, 10-year-old rape victims having to go to other states to get care. They know that's really unpopular. That's why Mitch McConnell told Lindsey Graham after Dobbs, don't you dare bring an abortion ban to the Senate. We don't want to vote on that. That'll cost us races. Let the states do it, basically. That's why he told Rick Scott not to bring up Social Security. That's why they booed Joe Biden, shouted him down when he was giving a State of the Union. They knew what he was saying about their view on Social Security was really unpopular. Gun, they know the gun issue. If there was a straight up referendum on basic background checks, they know they'd lose. So they understand that their views, if essentially elections were a referendum on a fair playing field every two years, like that Kansas August election that last year on abortion, they know they would lose again and again and again. But rather than amending their views to actually reflect the mainstream views of America, they don't go that direction. They actually take advantage of the first assumption, which means their goal is not to do what the side of the left's goal is, which is battle over elections on a fair democracy playing field. Their goal is a battle over democracy itself. That's their, that's their battle. Never forget that that's their battle. I think those on this call realize that but their goal is actually a little more specific. How do you undermine democracy enough that it may still feel like democracy because you're voting, but you can rig it enough so that the, um, the minority worldviews that you espouse can stay in place even if they would lose in a fair democracy? How do you subvert democracy enough to lock in views that they know are unpopular? That is the heart of their battle. And again, this is when some uh, more moderate-minded people who, and I want to, I want to have a broad, as broad a support of democracy as possible. So I don't want to offend people who may be on our side. But some of them will say, "David, this seems outlandish. Are you really saying they they don't want a fair democracy?" And the answer is again, look at them. They went to Hungary and studied Orban. They're not hiding this. Peter Thiel, who supported J.D. Vance's campaign in Ohio with millions, literally wrote 10 years ago, he doesn't think democracy is consistent with freedom. That's what he said. They're literally now creating this whole mindset that we were never a democracy. We're a republic. I get that tweeted to me every single day. They're trying to undermine the very notion of a broad democracy in plain sight. So yeah, that is their goal. And they're not hiding it. But once that's their goal, the battle of, I described us going through, which is swing states, federal races, Long term, that would not be successful for them. Again, that'd be having an open election on their issues in places like Pennsylvania or Georgia. They lose those battles. They can't even win them in Kansas. So what's their battle? Where do they go? It turns out, to go back to this first slide, the single best institution for them to do what I've talked about is state houses. To use Carville's old line, it's the state houses, stupid. That is where they can lock in a minority worldview over time, and that's what this whole book I wrote a couple of years ago, Laboratories of Autocracy, was all about. Why state houses? And this is their this is some of the key elements of their very unpopular agenda. Most of these things are very unpopular once people understand that's what they're doing. Why state houses? Because state houses control every single issue that we all care about. Usually more directly and far more often than the federal government, state houses control tax rates, health care what's taught in schools, the quality of those schools, where does school funding flow to, um, does a woman have a right to choose, how do we regulate guns, climate, on and on and on. They're passing bills and state house sessions every year on these issues, which means not only do, do, are these issues that affect us all every day that we care about, these are the issues at the heart of their right-wing agenda, um, right here. So they can get on with, that's why Mitch McConnell said, Hey, don't bring it to the Senate, Lindsay. You can do this in state after state. They have the same power and no one's paying attention. So number one, they control every issue they care about in their agenda, except for a couple federal ones, can run right through state houses and do all the time. Number two, even better for them long-term, 
State houses control democracy itself far more directly than, do, than does Congress. And again, far more frequently. They write the rules about who votes, when they vote, how they vote, how long can they vote? Do they have one drop box, zero drop boxes, hundreds of drop boxes? How do you register? How do you get knocked off the rolls? Do you have a month, a week, a day? With that comes the power, as we know, sadly, to shape the electorate itself. And if your goal in life is to keep the majority from ruining your minority worldview plans, that's a pretty powerful tool to be able to shape the electorate, isn't it? Well, that's what state houses can do. Number two, these state houses also draw district lines. And with the power to draw district lines comes the power to draw a representative democracy with accountability or in the wrong hands to rig the whole damn thing. So not only do you have a party falsely representing its state, where even in 2018, for example, states that voted, some of you are probably from these states, the majority of the citizens chose Democrats to run their state house. The gerrymandered systems turned out from those votes, Republican majorities and super majorities. This is a system, by the way, that Vladimir Putin would admire for maintaining minority rule, even when the voters are weighing in as clearly as they are here. Um, but more than even falsely representing the majority of a state, which is, again, very important if you remember their, what their game plan is, even more important is the fact that in many of these states, we are talking about institutions where virtually not a single member ever has a real election in their career. Not in their career. This is the average margin of victory over a 10-year period in the last gerrymander, the 2011 to 21 gerrymander of Ohio. You will see that 50 of the 62 seats they basically gave themselves, the average margin of victory was 20% or more, 38, 30, 38 of them, 38% or more. All of them 10% or more uh, once an incumbent that was on the Democratic side termed out in the, in the Republican nature of the seat became clear. They're not in a world of accountability. And this is a really important point. Without accountability, what happens? Public service and all the incentives that lead to good public service because there's accountability, without accountability, those incentives turn upside down. All of a sudden, the incentive to be mainstream, that's people in a, in a fair district feel, you, wouldn't, you don't get away with, with being an extremist in a fair district. Well, if the general elections are over before they start, then you can be an extremist and, and survive. I'll go through in a second a different presentation. Um, most of these people, are how, not most, but a whole lot of them aren't even being challenged anymore in November elections. So the old, the old incentive of a fair district of being a mainstream person is now all about being extremist because you only worry about the next primary. And if you worry only the next primary, the only thing you worry about is not being extreme enough. And that's what's driving so much of the downward spiral. The incentive in these broken places is to be extreme and never to be caught as a moderate. That's how you lose. Number two, to go to the top one here, if you get reelected or essentially reappointed with no competition every two years, the old incentive that you better deliver good public outcomes to get ahead in politics, that disappears. You could have the worst streets, the worst schools, the lowest wages, the hospital can shut down and no one can vote you out. So there's no longer a link between actually delivering public outcomes and getting reelected. And boy, is that dangerous as people in Ohio and Florida and Texas are figuring out as public outcomes are in a downward spiral in all these places. And the same people keep going back into office despite that. They actually have a different incentive now. Their incentive is to serve private interests who are in that state house every day and they can control these people's futures. Even people back home have no stake as a gerrymandering in uncontested races. So whether it's financial interests or right-wing social interests or, or others, or, democ or, or those attacking democracy itself, they've got a really uh, uh, paying attention audience in these state houses, even if the public back home isn't, isn't involved in their calculus. And what does that mean? It means that the nonstop MO of these state houses is taking public goods and giving it to these private players. Whether it's school funding to private players, whether it's energy bills that we pay on to private players leading to scandals, on and on and on, they are giving away public power and public interest and public goods 
to the private players and taking it from the public. And again, that's why this, the downward out, the downward spiral of outcomes is happening. Ohio was ranked fifth in the nation 12 years ago in the quality of our public schools. Now we're in the mid twenties. Why? They gave so much of money to for-profit scams. that didn't educate kids that came right out of good public schools. So in the final, the final incentive, once you are delivering terrible public outcomes, and once you are an extremist sending 10 year old rape victims to Indiana, even though for, for abortion care, even though very few of, of um, Ohioans support that, once you are committed yourself to a course of that career of an extremism and bad public outcomes, of course, there's one other really bad incentive, isn't there, in, in their mind, which is never allow a healthy democracy back into that state because a healthy democracy would mean they would lose if they were in a fair district, wouldn't it? You, can't, you couldn't defend those public in, outcomes. You couldn't defend that extremism. So that's why whenever we think, oh, they'll, let, they'll stop attacking democracy, how can they ever go further? It, they know that their extremism can only be sustained if they keep attacking democracy. So these incentives all work off each other. And that gets back to this opening slide. If your battle plan is to lock in a minority worldview over time, through a system where democracy is diverted, the set of incentives in the powers I've just described to you make the state houses the perfect place to do it. They're incentivized to do everything you need done to give you to profit yourself, like the Koch brothers or other utilities or something, or right wing social interests or trickle down. These places are the perfect institutions to do that. And that's why their big focus are, is state power, starting with state houses and including other positions that also have an impact, whether it be state Supreme Courts that can either hold these places accountable or not, et cetera, et cetera. That's the heart of their battle. And so I'll, I'll, I'll flip to a more optimistic thing in a second. But if you play out each of these, these two sides battle over time, one side focusing on swing states in federal years, only in swing states for the most part, celebrating when it wins those elections as if it's won the whole battle. And the other side on the right is battling everywhere, every year they can. And when they win the, each battle, they lock that state in through gerrymandering, they suppress the hell out of the other side and the, and the voters of the other side, and then they run an extremist agenda through that state, no one can stop it. Who's gonna win? It's pretty clear, isn't it? The side on the right is, is to use my son's if you read my book, I, I, Larry, you'll see I talked about my son playing soccer. My nine-year-old knows who's going to win. The team always on offense, like any uh, soccer field, is going to win. They are always on offense in the very place that shapes democracy, and we are not. And many times, as I'll show in a second, we're not even on defense, folks. We are letting them take shot after shot after shot against us, and, and whether it's what happened with Dobbs, whether it's Texas, whether it's that Ohio abortion ban, we're often not even challenging the very extremists pushing all these things on us. We let them run, run again without even opposition. So often we're not even playing defense. They will win if we keep letting this happen. Even, even when we think we've won in 20, the truth is long-term we're still losing because we're not fighting the battle they're fighting and we don't even see it too often for what it is. So what do we do differently? I'll go through this real quick. We reframe the battle. We, too, are in a battle for democracy like they are. We need to finally see that very clearly. It's the same battle the suffragists fought. It's the same battle that John Lewis fought. We are in a battle for democracy itself. Once, not, not some sort of little narrow battle for a few federal offices. That is not the way to view the political battle. That's the losing way to view it. We are in a battle for democracy itself. It starts in states where democracy is shaped. And once we see that, Everything looks different. And the flaws in our battle are clear. And the things we may be doing right are clear. And progress may be clear. And fake progress can also become clear. I'm going to go through five quick things, pivot to the new book for a second, and then open it up. What are five things that are very clear? One, democracy, the battle for democracy, once you see that's what it is, it's a long battle, folks. It's not just about the next cycle. It's not even about cycles at all. It's a long struggle. Again, it's a centuries long struggle. And the reason that's so helpful is it, it really shows you how the short cycle mindset of building up huge for a few months 
and then stopping for 18 months and then starting up again is such a losing approach to a long battle for democracy. You think John Lewis stopped fighting in December? You think Steve Bannon stops fighting in December? You think he stops recruiting election deniers to be election officials after a winning or losing? Of course not. We can't either. But it also allows you to see progress that you may be making even after a tough year. You know, when I was ODP chair, Joe Biden didn't really try and win Ohio. I'll just, I'll say it. I'm not saying that in a rude way. He didn't. But we won a massive Ohio Supreme Court race in 2020. Democrats won, just like we won in Wisconsin last April. We made a big win for democracy, even though people only were judging us by how Biden did when Biden didn't really try and win Ohio. So having a long game mindset allows you to see progress through thick and thin. If something's working, keep doing it. You might not have been a blue state one year. It doesn't mean you didn't register more people than ever. My best example of a long game mindset is what Stacey Abrams did in Georgia. She spent 20 years working for democracy in Georgia. If she had quit every time they were a red state for a federal election, she would have quit 20 years ago. But in 18, she inspired people to show up to run for, for to, to vote for, for governor. Throughout her time there, she voted against, she fought against voter suppression. She registered more voters. And even when she didn't win in 18 as governor, she said to the crowd gathered before her, we made progress because she had a long game. And two years later, we all saw what she meant, didn't we? All that she did built towards a blue uh, Georgia in 20, which frankly saved our country, at least when it comes to Donald Trump. Have a long game. You'll be inspired because you'll see that every, every meeting and everything you do is building to a long game through thick and thin and through cycles you may not control every part of. Number two, and I hope this is appealing. Um, hold on a second. Once you see we're in a battle for democracy itself, we better be fighting in all 50 states, right? I mean, you can't, ex you can't allow dozens of states to exist in a world with no democracy, which is the status quo right now in this country. Because a whole lot of states don't meet the federal swing state formula, whatever it is, we've allowed a lot of them to just sink into, honestly, pardon my French, hell holes of non-democracy, where they're so gerrymandered where they're so rigged that most half these elections aren't even contested anymore by the against the very extremists pushing absurd laws that are unpopular. But we've decided since it's not about the federal swing state, it's not worth fighting there. Well, the hell it isn't. We're talking about democracy here. And when I finished my first book, the emails I got from, which was a lot about of Ohio, about other states too, but I got emails from everywhere, Florida, Tennessee, Missouri, you name it, Indiana, people just dying to reach out and say, thank you for writing this book. You just, you might've been describing Ohio, but you described how horrible it is to live right now in a state with no democracy. And the sad truth is they were writing from all over this country. It's just not right that we are allowing all these places to essentially no longer be functioning healthy democracies. I don't mind in the end if they're red states, if that's what the people want, but they shouldn't be rigged. Because one other problem with not contesting all these places is states that were moderately red only a few years ago are now insanely extreme. Iowa, Indiana, Missouri, states that voted for Democrats not long ago. Tennessee, not that long ago. But Iowa and Indiana voted for Obama. And now they're going through downward spirals, partly because we're not even in the, in the game. We're not even making an argument. And if we're not making an argument because we don't think it's a federal swing state, what happens? The extremists are essentially competing against each other and they fall into extremism. And of course, the one other reason to run everywhere is because you win some places you otherwise don't win if you don't run everywhere. Again, Kansas should be a bat signal. These places are legislating far more extreme than the people themselves are. I'm living that in Ohio. That's true in Florida. Texas is a pro-choice state, but you never give yourself a chance to show that if you abandon all these places because you don't think they'll help you win a Senate, a Senate seat or a presidential. Once you realize democracy is on the line, we got to run everywhere. I'll, I'll be very quick on the next couple of ones. Number three is same story within states. We can no longer only run in the swing areas and in, in, in the core democratic areas of states. Because again, that leaves entire swaths of these states only to be hotbeds of extremism where they're only fighting against themselves, which makes them more extreme, as opposed to having a Democrat come along and say, oh, by the way, you guys destroyed rural schools. Uh, that was your vote in the state house. 
We have to be running everywhere. It lifts turnout by doing so. It helps us statewide. But even more importantly, from a democracy standpoint, it brings accountability back to places that don't have any right now. And it's the lack of accountability that's allowing them to become so extreme. It, it's the reason those incentives I mentioned earlier are so poisonous. We're not even in the argument, even though, frankly, there are a lot of good arguments we can make if we were. We have to create an infrastructure that values running everywhere. That's a key step to bring accountability back to these broken systems. Number four, this is this is much more than Donald Trump. And this is an important point as well. When we think this is only about Donald Trump, although he's awful, we can't afford to have him win again, we, but we blind ourselves to the fact that this started before Trump ever ran for anything. If he were locked up tomorrow, they would still be gerrymandering. They'd still be banning books. They'd still be banning water in Georgia. He's a symptom. He, he sort of was cover for people to become worse sort of on the uh, in the public sphere than they've been before he was fuel to the fire in a way but the fire had already started through through states most of the antecedents to what we're dealing with now election denialism and all that if you read my first book all started before and as he was running it was a response to obama winning more than trump running honestly part of our long history unfortunately of a backlash when a, when our diverse majority tries to exercise its will through democracy why is that so important? Because when we make it only about Trump, we provide cover to a whole lot of Republicans who may not act like Trump or sound like Trump, may even say they don't like him, but are attacking democracy as brutally as he is through all the ways I've talked about. In Ohio, we have a Secretary of State, his name is LaRose, has done far more damage to democracy in Ohio than Trump ever has. But he doesn't act like Trump. So we may, he, he almost, to average voter, it's like, he, oh, he's not, he's not like Trump. A whole lot of people, by the way, Joe Biden, we didn't win a single state house in 20, pick up one. One reason, millions of people voted for Joe Biden and then voted Republicans the rest of the way, because we said it was only about Trump. And the truth is, um, a lot of those Republicans who they voted for, being told that Trump was against democracy too extreme, it was those Republicans down ballot that gerrymandered, banned water, um, you know, kept suppressing, you name it. We got to make sure that, the, that, that we're clear. It's about democracy. Are you for it or against it? If you're for it, let's cross party lines and fight for it. If you're against it, I don't care how unlike Trump you are, you're on the wrong side, we wanna beat you. Number five, last one. Once you, and this is what the heart of the second book's all about. Once you realize it's democracy itself in states, one, those stakes are so big, I hope it inspires people to realize there is so much more they need to be doing to, to, to fight this fight that we've been doing typical political work. I go through great details in the book. But number two, once you realize that the heart of democracy is not some faraway swing state, but it's that uncontested race in Oklahoma where you live, or it's the fact that we didn't do enough in New York because it wasn't a swing state, so turnout was so low, we lost the House through those New York congressional seats, or the school board race that, that, that is a site of book banning or not book banning, depending on who wins it. Or it's the fact that they've been suppressing the hell out of votes in Cleveland or Cincinnati or Columbus. So we need to figure out how every institution in those communities can be put to work to lift those purge voters back into democracy. Bottom line, the front line in battle for democracy is not some faraway place. That false narrative that it is is so disempowering to most people who watch Rachel Maddow get depressed by the state of democracy, but conclude, well, I don't live in Pennsylvania. I'm not on the Trump jury in Florida. There's nothing I can do. When the truth is, when it's a battle for democracy in the front line or states across this country, there is so much you can do right now. And the book tries to walk you through it. We're in a battle for democracy itself. The scale against it is enormous. We need every single person to see that they have a huge role they can play. And the second book is all about that. So let me just go to one quick thing and then, and then wrap up. Um, you'll, I hope, like this. So a couple quick things I like in the new book. This is when I say we're on off, they're on offense and we're not. This is what it looks like in my son's eyes. That's the Tennessee State House, the Georgia State House, the Mississippi State House, Wisconsin, Ohio, Florida. They're shooting shot after shot after shot at our goal. And we're often not even blocking the shots, let alone on their side. What happened when, um, when, um, um, Dobbs came down. Most of what we heard from federal officials was, that's terrible. We must elect more U.S. senators. 
That's like looking at this picture and saying the team that's losing, if they only had a better goalie, would win. What do we need to do? We need to start blocking the shots. We need to get in the game where they are attacking democracy. And when I say we're not playing defense here, this is what I'm talking about. This is the 2022. It's a shocking slide I found. These are the uncontested races in all these states. Look at this. 55%, 45%, 54%. Tennessee, where the Republicans were attacking. By the way, this is all in the new book, and some of it's online at a website I have um, that I'll link to. The Tennessee Republicans who kicked out the two Justins, half of them didn't even have an opponent last year. Of course they're acting like this. They're better off kicking out two Justins when they don't have an opponent in November to challenge them for it than voting with Democrats where they lose a primary by voting with Democrats to keep them. So we fuel this. Gerrymandering is the original sin, but we make it even worse when half these people don't even face an opponent. We need people knocking on the doors of every single one of these extremists, and they're running their extremism through these seats, exposing what they are doing. And sometimes we'll win, and sometimes we won't. We'll, we'll lose far more than we'll win. But the accountability that comes and the transparency that comes from running against these people is far more important. Uh, and, and the damage done by not running is a disaster year after year. These entire places are dominated, if you look at these numbers, by the uncontested people. And, and of course, they're setting the policies. They have no accountability whatsoever. They could care less how extreme they are when there's not even a person talking about what they're doing that next November. We've got to change that. Um, and I, I go through in the book, I won't go through all the details here. Um, we have to start rethinking how we, we create an infrastructure so that we are only giving, this is sort of a hypothetical Amy McGrath pie chart. I don't blame her for raising $100 million to meet Mitch McConnell. That's what a candidate's supposed to do. But we need to have a conversation with the grassroots donors and others that fueled that race to say, if we took 10% of that $100 million and put it in all those contested, ra uncontested races in the very place democracy is being attacked, in places with equally good chance to win as the Mitch McConnell race, we'd be funding 40, 50 races, wouldn't we? We have to think that way. And I go, my book goes through all sorts of ways to do that. Uh, let me just close, and I can talk about a lot of other parts of the new book. Um, well, the, the, key, the big takeaway in the new book is everyone has a footprint of influence, and we, we use far too little of it in lifting democracy. We basically fundraise a little bit. We give it some time. And, what I'm, and this is where democracy abroad, I'd love to work with you on this. Every single person has a network that, that I call their footprint. And we have to put, once we see it's democracy itself, we have to put far more of our footprint to work lifting democracy. If you're on the board of a homeless shelter in Cincinnati, is it registering the voters that Frank LaRose, as secretary, has been purging? Is every mayor of every city using every public face of the service to engage voters that walk through that door? After you sign into the health clinic, are you asked if you're registered to vote? My worry is in too many places, the answer is we never even thought of doing that. We have to put our, all of our footprints to work to lift democracy to get to a lot of the voters we're not getting to. Uh, but let me just close by saying, I'm actually very optimistic in the end about this moment. I wrote this book very quickly and I wrote it quickly because we have so much work to do, but that work can be successful. We have a winning streak going right now for democracy. The August Kansas referendum, we won. We won secretary of state races all across in November when election deniers were running in all those swing states. Not a single election denier won in a swing state. We picked up the Pennsylvania State House, the Michigan State House, the Michigan Senate, the, Min the Missouri Minnesota Senate. Why? And, oh, sorry. And then we win the Wisconsin Supreme Court race. Why did all those things happen? And, and the House results were not what you normally expect in a year where we have the White House. If you remember what I said in the beginning, their extremism, they've been working hard to hide it. It's not hidden anymore, is it? Dobbs made it very clear what the outcome of their extremism is for millions and millions of people. Mar Marjorie Taylor Greene is the face of the Republican Congress. The primary will be a nonstop downward spiral between Trump and DeSantis of who can out extreme the other. And state houses are literally on steroids passing the craziest laws ever. Their extremism is exposed finally. And we also have some grassroots infrastructure that's starting to support more of these state house candidates. Secretary of State candidates and ongoing organizing throughout. 
And that's why, again, I wrote the book quickly, because if we can take advantage of a moment where their extremism is so clear and run that contrast, not just for a presidential race, Biden, Trump, like we did in 20, but run that contrast all the way through down to state house, school board, and everywhere else, we can put together one hell of a winning streak for democracy that includes winning in August, this issue one in Ohio, winning Virginia in November, and then in other states, and then runs right on through next November. So if, you know, not to talk too much about my book, but if we do the kinds of things that I push in this book and that other people are pushing in other important ways and that you guys do all the time, and we draw that contrast to their extremism, I think what started in 22 and is continuing in 23 can, can mean banner years coming up to, to win the battle for democracy over time. So I'll stop talking when a couple of minutes over, would love to take any questions you guys have. Thank you. Uh, there's a question from David Schallenberger. David, do you want to unmute and go ahead and ask? Sure. Um, I, I also posted it in the chat. Um, I just want to um, thank you for your, your, your fire and your energy. Um, we have a, we try to have a very comprehensive GOTV effort, but we're limited by our volunteer base. And I'm hoping things like what you're saying will fire some people up. Um, we've got some great GOTV leaders on this call and you've given us um, strategy and energy and ways that, that we can move forward. Was, I think too often we do focus on the presidential race and, and, you know, as you say, the state health races are important. So I just wanted to thank you for that. Thank, and let me just say, it's additive. I, I, it makes me crazy that we have Joe Biden running in Georgia with 40 districts uncontested. That could be 40 people, local candidate, known, let's say a retired teacher, knocking on doors, helping Joe Biden. So it's not even as if they're in contrast or in conflict leaving these districts uncontested hurts the statewide efforts. I mean, Stacey Abrams, Tim Ryan, Beto O'Rourke had to cover for 40 and 50 districts, millions of people who weren't having that local candidate running. And so it, it helps Biden, I think, in the end to start doing this stuff as well. So it's, it's not that we can't, we cannot allow Trump to win, obviously, but by building from the bottom up and by running everywhere, we lift everywhere. But one other thing, by the way, on that, and, and I apologize if you're a little fired up, it's driving me crazy right now. And you're probably seeing this some online. Republicans are literally taking credit in red states for all of Joe Biden's policy. All of them. I, Mike DeWine in Ohio every day. You wouldn't know it. Well, if you don't run everywhere, there's no one to point that out. If you're running everywhere, I sh you show up and say, Hey, I'm glad Mike DeWine's here celebrating Joe Biden's bill, but this was a Democrat who did this. It's, this has nothing to do with that guy. But if we're not running, they literally have it all to themselves. And so it ends up being a messaging advantage as well. Uh, the other thing that it does is it also doesn't let us show that their policies are the failures. When we're not running everywhere, and again, this goes to all the way to the top level races, when we're not, when we're not running everywhere, they can blame schools falling apart on caravans from Mexico that they make up, as opposed to the fact that the state house voted against those schools for 10 straight years. But if no one's running, we don't get to say that. So it hurts the collective effort. It's not in conflict. It hurts the collective effort in so many ways when we're leaving so many people out of the conversation by not running. Thank, Thank you for your nice words. Yeah, Janet, did you have a question? Yes. Uh I was wondering if uh, Mr. Pepper could tell us a super, super succinct way to respond to uh, MAGAs and some left, excuse me, uh, right-leaning independents about when they say that they believe the Republicans are the ones who are saving democracy. That's a great question. Um, I mean, a couple things. One, I wouldn't, this is going to, uh, you know, I, when I was a kid, I'm a, I'm an older guy when it comes to politics. So when I ran for city council, I did knock on every single door. Um, and I didn't, I didn't use data to only talk to friendly voters. And I'm glad I did. And I would have respectful arguments with people, not even arguments, conversations. So this is going to sound strange when I say that 
I we're we're at a world now where I wouldn't spend that much time trying to win over a MAGA. I, I just think that we're not changing those minds, and that's fine. Yeah, I, I'm respectful. I mean, I have a guy who does a little bit of work. I have a um a property in rural Ohio where my wife grew up. He and I could not be more polar opposite, but I give him credit. He reads all my books. He gives me a hard time about them. He has the view you described, but I have a civil conversation and he'll probably never vote for anything I care about. But we both, he's so extreme that he agrees with me that the, the establishment Ohio Republican Party is corrupt. So we do break bread over that topic. But my main goal is we, we got the number one thing we have to do is get our voters out. We win elections and we get our voters out. And then we need to work hard to get the um, certain swing voters in. So to pivot to the answer of who I would try and win over. And I have a whole section on my book on this. The outcome, and this especially applies to those of you from red states. And this is going, this is going to your, your Edgar's point as well. Two things. One, most importantly, I think long term, the broken state governments that are a result of their gerrymandered rigged systems, going back to that slide I showed you, there's a diagram in the book on this. As I described, when their motivation is to give away public goods to private players, what will happen in these states is terrible public outcomes. That's what I'd focus on with those types of voters. The first, if I were a candidate, for example, Hey, our rural public school, we're paying a thousand more every month or a thousand in the fall so Johnny can play football. Well, why is that? Because they, they gave their money to a donor who's running a for profit school that's a disaster. Or in a state, in many states, they're down to four days of school a week. Run on that. Run on the fact that the small town hasn't had new infrastructure in 10 years. Run as Gretchen Whitmer did on the fact that they had to fix the damn roads in Michigan. The, the outcomes that they are generating are very weak. And so I think the way to get to these other voters, besides getting our voters out, is frankly not to have high level arguments on democracy. It's to focus on the outcomes that are a disaster, that, that are indefensible, and to make those clear and to explain that that's what they did. And the best example I put in my book of that is Laura Kelly, the governor of Kansas, a Democrat, who's now in her second term. How did she win? You guys all remember Sam Brownback? Sam Brownback destroyed Kansas schools by cutting the budget so much. That was her campaign. She didn't even talk about Chris Kobach suppressing the vote, which she could have. She basically said, I'm going to fix Kansas schools. They were the values of our state when I was young. They've been destroyed. We're fixing them. So rather than getting into these, these big debates that we often can talk about, like here and in my book, to message a winning message, get to the outcomes that are less partisan and that actually affect everyday people in a way that uh, is their first level concern. Like, hey, I have, two, I have two kids myself, so I know this. There's no school on Friday. What the heck are we going to do? And that's a crisis, whatever party you're in. If you have two or three kids, you're a working family, you can't get daycare. That's what it focuses on. The other one, I know you, I, I failed your succinct part of your question. The second thing, though, is on some of these issues, they are so extreme. Don't shy away from pointing that out. Uh, that What happened to that 10-year-old rape victim in Ohio being forced to go to Indiana is something that 5% of Ohioans support. So again, don't get into a large argument about democracy necessarily. Point out that their extremism is so crazy that if people understand that, 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 that they may vote against them for that reason versus a broad, higher level argument democracy. There's more to say, but I'll stop with that already having failed to be succinct. <laughs> Thank you. Next is Alona, followed by Edgar. Oh, hi. Thank you, first of all, for your passion. This is one of the things that we really have problems being able to harness here and to be able to spread that kind of passion. Uh, one of the concerns is literally the apathy and the number of people who have expressed to me so negatively, the ones who have come to Mexico is, we're here, we're out of there. We don't like government. We are, we are afraid of government. We don't trust government. Uh, and this is a view that I haven't lived in the States for almost 40 years. So I'm not sure how relevant that is within the US, but certainly the people who feel they must escape, who feel that they must um, uh, somehow or other choose a non-government path. And there's actually groups in Mexico who are forming or who are recruiting 
people with this in mind. I mean, they really are kind of cult clannish here about being against the United States. And of course, the irony of all this is, is that democracy should be something that we have been raised with and we've grown up. I mean, uh, do you have any ways that you see uh, specifically for those of us who are dealing with people who are out from outside, who have come from yeah, out I mean, to if, here. If they're truly checked out again, you may not get them back in. I, I would put more I would put more time into getting the folk. Well, there are two things. One, there is going to be a set of people who are concerned about the lo loss of democracy itself. My guess is that's actually a higher percentage among those in other countries. Um, I think you probably, you're, my guess is people there are more attentive to, to that issue since you're not living the day to day of what's happening in America, but the democracy question is probably really troubling. And you're on the, so I grew up as half my childhood, I spent overseas, I actually lived in, I worked in Russia for three years uh, in the nineties. So my guess is you're hearing like what I would have heard, which is what the hell's going on in your country? And so my guess is people are pretty attentive to democracy. So you, I would talk to those people. But the second is going back to the question from before, we need to explaining to people the, the consequence of that lack of democracy is really important. And so whether or not they're into who's for democracy, the one reason I think we had such a good year in 22, sadly, is because Dobbs made so clear what a lack of democracy leads to and how directly the impact is on people's lives. And so if you say it's a battle for democracy and the reason, you don't need to say the, that term, by the way, but the truth is the reason they don't want a strong democracy is to impose things on the rest of us that most of us don't agree with, like abortion bans, no exceptions. That'll wake people up real quick. And all the other things that come the only reason we have no common sense gun reform is because we don't have a democracy that reflects the fact that there's a vast majority of people want that. And so once you translate it into those issues, you can get to a lot of these folks. And if, if those things don't work, move on. Well, um, I'm Hungarian, by the way. So, I mean, I'm Hungarian American, but I have dual citizenship. So I know exactly what you're meaning. And I remember Orban when he was a young, uh, very uh, populist communist. He was a, yeah, he, I, I've read enough by about everybody him. and look what he became. Yeah. So at any rate, yes, no, you're absolutely but right. I, I think, it's, <laughs> and, and, and that's allowed him to pass push policies that the people don't support. Thank you. Next Thank you, Edgar. Ilana. Edgar next and then Belinda. Great. Edgar. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I was just wondering, if we, if we get to do everything you suggested, that is great and that's going to help us move back and push back at the state level. However, we are already facing a problem with gerrymandering, with gerrymandering that makes it exponentially difficult to win over those state house. So the first obstacle we have here is gerrymandering. How yes. can we deal with it? Great question. And by the way, if you've watched Ohio, you know no one has lived that more than me because we have been cursed by it. Um, but if you look at that slide I showed you, go back to it. Uh, the one slide, I, well, I won't go back to it. Um, Michigan showed that you can beat it. If, you, if you're in a state that can get on the ballot, you can beat it. We got it on the ballot in Ohio. 70% of Ohioans supported ending gerrymandering and adding rules. Now our lawless state house ignored those rules, um, but and and should have been held accountable and weren't. But it's it's clear that if you can get it on a ballot, and this one reason in Ohio, this issue one, they're trying to raise the threshold to sixty percent. Are you all watching that battle? Why? Because they're worried not only about the abortion uh, ballot language this November, they're worried about a, a, a gerrymandering one in the future. Because when these have been put on lately, they're winning. Uh, Michigan, again, Michigan got rid of gerrymandering a couple of years ago, and in 2022, they won their state house. So we also need federal solutions to gerrymandering. If we win the Senate and the House next November, we all have to be the loudest, most annoying Democrats possible to tell the senators of the Democratic Party that never again can we have power and not pass a new Voting Rights Act that protects against gerrymandering. 
And I worry sick to your frustration, Gar, that the, that the, if we don't do this, the 2020 to 22 Senate term and term where we had all three parts of power, right? That the single most important result of that two years was not anything positive we did, but that we failed to pass a new Voting Rights Act. Now, uh, that's a negative thing to say. So I flip it to the positive, right? Because I don't want to be a downer. If we manage to get Biden, keep the U.S. Senate and win the House back, and we surely should win the House back in 24, the Senate's the biggest question. If we get that done, we should never again accept that they don't do as the first thing, passing of the voting rights bills that they had that were filibustered and having gerrymandering protection be a part of it. The Supreme Court has literally said, as conservative mm -hmm. as they are, and the Moore v. Harper thing didn't change this, that they will not protect against gerrymandering, but they said the U.S. Senate and House can. So they need to when we have it. And frankly, I'm I frustrated. If you read my first book, it was a plea to them to do it. They didn't do it. They, the, 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 and we're, so we're stuck with it, but, the, but we should take it on. So state-based reform, federal reform, even better. But here's the one part I'd add, even with it, run everywhere. When we don't run in all these places, we're rewarding their gerrymandering and we're making it worse. I would rather have us run all over, give them hell in every district, point out extremists in every, different, every district. At least that leads to some accountability versus half of them not even having an opponent, which I think the damage is so much worse when we do that. And it means we never win. So fix gerrymandering. That's an obsession of mine. But run everywhere, even in a gerrymandered world, or you make it that much worse. David, okay, are you thank okay you. I'm done with that. <laughs> thank you. David, are you okay going about 10 yeah, more Yeah, I'm fine. Thank I'm fine. you. Melinda, go ahead. Hi, David. Thank you. Hey. Um, I subscribe to Robert Reich, and in the last few days, he has suggested that as the polling numbers are increasing for Robert Kennedy Jr., that we need to be concerned that he's going to run as an independent and pull votes from Biden. Do you have any response to that concern? Um, I, I, that's scary, honestly. Yes. All, all this... So I, that, any, you probably, none of you have probably read my, my fiction side, but my fiction side always seems to come true. So I wrote a book in two, between 2012 and 2015 that was um, all about um, a Russian rigging an American election through the States. Um, I, I just wrote it because I used to work in Russia. Uh, then we all know what happened. My next book was called The Wingman. And it was about special interests backing ghost candidates to pull votes away from the favor they didn't want to win. And I worry right now that that's both, I know not worry, that is what the Kennedy thing is. You can look at their donors. Um, and this no labels thing is the same thing. I think they know Trump is very likely going to be the candidate. I think Trump enters the general as a weaker candidate than 16 and 20. I actually think he, his, his message was a little more, I mean, it's going to sound weird to say, but in, in 16, he was saying he would do certain things. Now it's just anger about 2020. It's a bizarre campaign. Um, I think he's in a worse place running. I think they know that. So I think that's what No Labels is about. But yeah, if Robert Kennedy flipped to the, um, to the to be an independent, yeah, that would be very dangerous. I, I think a straight up Biden-Trump matchup is still quite good for us. But you, th you start throwing in third parties, I think it's a problem. Now, I do think it's harder to pull that off in many states than it, it may. It, I don't want to be I worry about what you just described. No labels has been working for a year to get someone on the ballot in the way they are. If they don't if they don't get to work until pretty late to do that with Kennedy, they may not get on in many states. Now, only a few states can make the difference. But, yeah, that's that is a that would be a real concern. Thank you. Next up is Randy. And, and Edgar, I worry that the, the Trump base, Edgar asked, would independent candidates feel crazy from ours too? The Trump base is so locked into Trump. I think that, that other candidates, the risk is the, the, that the more moderate ours would vote for Biden and not Trump. The, the Trump voters will not vote for anybody but Trump. They wouldn't go to a Kennedy. 
And, and so we lose the margin of victory through that independent candidate. I, that's my fear. And um, I, I haven't seen anything to, to convince me otherwise. Randy, go ahead. Hi, David. Hey. So I've read your book three times. I've taken the new copious, one. The new one. I've oh, taken wow. copious notes. I've incorporated lots of it into my GOTV activities as I coordinate that for Canada. Um, and part of it is is the information. The other part of it is the enthusiasm that you bring to that information and your passion for all of this. And I want you to know, and I want the people on this call to know that Democrats Abroad has begun looking at state teams as an idea to focus on what's happening in state. Um, it's a little it's a little out of the wheelhouse for us because we're not physically there. So that limits us. But many of us have friends and family back in our states or we go home to our states. I'm in Montreal and I'm from New York and I'm from Long Island. I vote in New York three. So I have the distinct dishonor of having George Santos representing us there. Um, but I spend time there. And so I'm made aware of the local issues. And so as a DA member in Canada, I'm looking at how can I impact local races? So there's, there's my brother who's involved in politics there has made me aware of a very local race for town supervisor. And so what I've chosen to do as a New York State team leader is to use our database and find our overseas voters who vote in those zip codes and let them know that this race is happening. Because for those of us who live far away, we don't know. Yeah. But I'm going to make sure they do know. And I'm going to encourage them, based on a lot of the arguments you make in your book, that it's important to have a level of involvement that includes those really local races. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, that's great. You do that. So you, you'll know from reading the book that I encourage any group that's talking politics about a state to have a state house level, at least uh, person or team that, that is at every meeting informing the group about what's happening there. By the way, this is important in red states. So you can talk about, we have, do we have to make some calls about that terrible education bill, about that terrible voting bill? But it's also important in blue states because New York State has a lot of work to do to improve its voting laws. And one of the problems is when we don't have blue states living up to our democracy standards, not only does turnout suffer like it did in 22, but the red states use that to hit us over the head. That, hey, well, New York doesn't do it. Why should we do it here? So I think every group should have, as I put in the book, every political group should say, okay, at every meeting we have, we'll have a report out from someone who's basically been tasked with paying attention to what's happening in the state house of this state. And what's interesting is, one, and I have a group that I started called Blue Ohio. Every month we do this. It's always really interesting stuff. I mean, people will all of a sudden think first, well, really? Is that, that sounds kind of, no, it's, the update will be on all the hottest topics in politics because the state house activity is usually an assault on all these things. Um, so um, thank you for thank you for your kind words. And uh, I think having some state level, you know, oh, the other thing I put in the book that Randy would know is these places are so long ignored that often the noise you make at that state house level is far louder yeah. than just being put down in the database for having made a call to Congress. So your voice can be far louder to state house. And I go through in the book examples of very bad things that were stopped, even in a gerrymandered Ohio regard, because because people got so many calls that they thought the entire state was livid, even though it was probably was just a really well-organized group of 100 people. Um, so your voice at that level can make a big difference. And there's no reason why you couldn't do that partly from abroad as well. Thank you. I'm any, gonna, other any, any other questions? Well, this I'm going to give you, someone did this already, but a link. My website has, you know, it, it does have a link to the book for anyone who wants to buy it, but it also has kind of, um, I put a lot of diagrams in the book in little, you know, uh, Randy, you'll see that the, you, you saw the diagrams. I had these little worksheets that include like how to use your own footprint to actually, um, you know, engage voters and all that. And if you look at the link there, one thing that would be really interesting for me is if you're each organizing different states, you know, pass along this footprint and um, see if people will fill it out and start to see what they do, because 
once you start thinking about, I'm gonna, I'll put a link to it up if I, already, if I didn't do it already. Once you start thinking about all the ways that you could live democracy, the truth is it becomes very, here's the link to the PDF. It becomes very clear there's so much more we could be doing that we just aren't doing. Not because we're doing anything wrong, we're just not thinking of it. You know, uh, Sherrod Brown, when he was Secretary of State, convinced all McDonald's to have a voter registration form on every tray that they would serve food on. That's a heck of a lot of people. Um, or again, if you're on if you're on the board of a health clinic, is everyone signing in to get their to get treatment? Being asked if they if they're registered. That's a lot of people, and it's a lot of people that are the very people who are being purged from the rolls. And it's the people that we often don't knock on the doors of because they haven't voted so much that they're not in our target space, but we better get to them. So I go through in the book just so many other ways that we can make a difference. And, and I will say in closing, the, I know you've been saying that some of your folks in these countries are not as fired up. Every time I'm with Democrats abroad, I'm amazed by the energy. You guys bring the energy. And so when I write a book like this, I, I'm thinking, when I think of Democrats abroad, I'm thinking, you're you're the ones I hope are picking up the book and taking notes because every meeting I've been to and every Zoom call, like you guys are as fired up as far as ways you may feel to make a difference. And as you know better than me, in many elections, you've been the difference in winning and losing. So I, I really appreciate all that you guys bring to bring to our battle. And this is Janet. I'm uh, I'm over at Nancy's house now uh, because my computer wasn't working. <laughs> And I would like to thank everyone who was with us today. And I'd also very, very much like to thank Mr. Pepper. His ideas were terrific. I am from Georgia, a Georgia voter, and I know exactly what he's saying. The overseas votes, the people living abroad and the military service members, that's what made the difference. Huge. Yeah, so uh, I would like to, again, stress how important it is that we vote and we make our voices heard. We here at uh, VA Let Chapala are so very, very proud of our get out the vote efforts. We want all of our citizens to exercise their rights to vote. And there will be more information upcoming on our Facebook page. And I can give you that Facebook link. Facebook.com slash D-A-L Chapala. Thank you all so very, very much. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay. Nice job. That was very yes. The RSVPs were 67, so I don't know. We got 35 at one point. Okay. Wonderful. Okay, so this is recorded and I'll put it up on our Facebook page and make it available for you to send out also um, if you want, Janet. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you.